Hello, and thank you for joining the first annual New Jersey Youth Transition Conference. I'm Katie Colhoun, and I will be your host for this session, um, How to Transition with the Division of Developmental Disabilities. I am joined by Inkichi Okoli with the D Division of Developmental Disabilities. Um, usually people refer to it as DDD, so you might be familiar with that as well. Um, she will be our presenter for today. A couple of housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, we encourage you to rename your Zoom profile to include your organization. This helps everyone get a sense of who is participating in the session. In this format, all participants are muted by default. If you'd like to communicate with myself or the panelists, please use the Q&A feature located on the bottom of your screen. Questions will be answered at the conclusion of the presentation. A recording of these presentations will be available within the next few days on our website at www.njyouthtransition.life. This session is also being closed captioned. In order to activate the closed captioning feature, please click on the live transcript, transcript button on the bottom of, the, of your screen and click show subtitle. If you need technology support at any point during the conference, you can access our live tech support Zoom room sponsored by Rich, Richard West, ATAC. The Zoom room link is available on our website on the conference agenda page. Please be patient as there may be many people seeking help at the same time. If you are having tech, tech difficulties now, please first check your sound and try signing out and signing back into the session before visiting the tech support room. Oftentimes this fixes the issue. Please note we have a hard stop at five minutes before the top of the next hour in order for us to host the next presentation room. So uh, at this point, I will hand over to our presenter in Coley uh, O'Keeley. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so good morning all, a pleasure to be here. Very excited to be a part of this first uh, youth transition conference. Um, please let me know if there's any questions that you guys may have through the Q&A box and we'll try our best to answer them throughout today's presentation. So I'm going to go ahead and just get started because we have a lot of information I want to share with you. Um, there's a lot that I'll touch on and then of course if we need to elaborate on anything um, through the q and I'll make sure to do so, okay? So again, my name is Nkechi Akoli, and I am the Senior Coordinator for a Transition to 21 at the Division of Developmental Disabilities. So I do these presentations uh, throughout the state, and in any case, after following this presentation, you feel that you would like this presentation for your smaller group or organization, by all means, you can reach out to me as well. One of the biggest things I want to focus on today is really just talking a lot about how people can prepare to come into our um, service system, what to expect when coming into our service system, and how to really make the most of utilizing our service system throughout their lifespan after they turn 21. So the first thing that we always do is really just connect everything that we're doing back to our mission um, at the Division of Developmental Disabilities. And that truly is to ensure that people really have the full life that they're looking for, right? That we help provide the supports and services for people to truly participate meaningfully in their communities and that they really get the opportunity to exercise their rights to make choices, okay? So as our organization continues to evolve, it's really focused on ensuring that people are getting that opportunity to really make choices in their own lives. With that being said, several years ago, we actually transitioned into a Medicaid fee-for-service system. And so what that means is that all individuals who will be on a waiver um, with the division are on either one of two waivers. They're on the community care program uh, waiver, or the supports program waiver. Before I go on, because um, I know I think I'm speaking a little bit fast, so I'll slow down a little bit. Um, you should have also have access to this PowerPoint. So you're able to go through it a little bit on your own as well, as well as the additional resource, okay? So as I mentioned, um, there are two main waiver programs, a community care program, as well as our supports program. Um, now people are either on one of them, they're not on both. All people in our service system must maintain Medicaid um, and they must obtain and maintain Medicaid. They also need to provide um, proof of approval um, because the providers also in our service system provide our Medicaid approved providers. 
Now, in the case that a or let's say they would like to work with an organization that is not an approved provider, but is just a regular business entity, they can still access those um, services. They would just go through goods and services. And we can talk more about that as we go forward. So as I mentioned, we are a fee-for-service system at this point. What that means is it's helped us standardize our service rates across the board. We've been able to really increase the services that we're able to deliver, um, as well as increase the flexibility that people have in identifying and utilizing services throughout our service system, okay? So let's say if a person only wants to attend a day program uh, once a week and they want to work and they want to do other things throughout the rest of their week, they are truly able to do that. They also have increased flexibility, flexibility as well as increased choice in what people are able to um, select and identify as services they're interested in utilizing. Uh, one of the great things that we're able to do is that if a person is utilizing a provider at this time, but then sees that that provider is not um, meeting their needs or they would like to utilize a given provider, they're able to switch that provider on a monthly basis as long as that new provider has availability, right? So they don't have to wait a whole year to make a switch. They can make that switch um, when they feel necessary. So who does DDD serve, right? I know I get that question a lot because sometimes people get a little confused um, as to when do they actually begin to access our services. So a person who is seeking services with the division can only begin to access our services at the age of 21. Now they can begin the application process prior to, and we're gonna talk about that in a few, but they only can begin to access our services starting at the age of 21. Now the person must have an intellectual and developmental disability that has occurred prior to the age of 22 and is lifelong. They must meet functional criteria, which we'll talk about in a few minutes must be a resident of New Jersey. And so even in this situation, let's say someone currently lives out of state, but are coming back in state, as long as they're back within the state, um, within six months um, of them applying, they're able to still uh, get op the opportunity to utilize our services, but they must be a resident of New Jersey. They also are eligible and for Medicaid, because again, we are a Medicaid fee-for-service system, so all people in our service system must obtain and maintain Medicaid. So as I mentioned, there are two main waiver programs that we have, our supports program, as well as our community care program. Or, or, um, and so what you'll see is that our supports program um, only began back in 2015, whereas people are more familiar with our community care program that existed since 1982. Uh, what you'll find is that when someone comes into our service system and they are determined eligible for our services, there is no wait list. They are automatically able to access services through our supports program. Now, there are some people who may go straight into our community care program. A lot of times it may be someone who already is in a residential placement. Um, and if they are determined eligible for that same level of care in our service system, then they would go directly onto our community care program. But most people would come in through our supports program. In the case that they are interested in going into the community care program, which does have some additional um, license settings that people can access and or residential homes that people can be able to go into, then they would be going onto our um, wait list or it'd be an emergency for them to be reviewed to be on the community care program. But we'll talk more about that in just a second. So if someone is interested in getting onto our community care waiting list, then what they would do is they would go through the process that is outlined on our website. So this is a little bit of the information that is associated to getting on the community care waiting list. I encourage that if someone believes that they would need that higher level of care um, later on in their life, then they could still apply to be on the community care waiting list to be reviewed once they get to the top of the list. One of the things that I always like to help people remember and make sure that I um, am saying is that just because you want to get on to the community care waiting list, uh, I'm sorry, to the community care program, 
you should still be able to access the supports program in the meantime. Okay, so every so often I find someone who says, well, I, I really believe I should be on the community care program. So I'm just going to wait for that. Uh, you don't have to. You don't want to uh, stop yourself from accessing services in the meantime. So go ahead. If the person you're supporting um, has been determined eligible for services throughout the division, they should be able to go ahead Begin, begin using the supports program if that's what they've been determined eligible for, and then also put themselves on the community care waiting list so that when they get reviewed for that, if they are determined eligible for it, they're able to just switch to that program. So the question becomes, how to prepare for life after 21? So the first thing that I always say is to step back from just thinking about services and really helping the person that you're supporting really just think about their own life. What are the things that they need? What are the things that they would like in their future? And how can they truly plan for what that future is going to look like, right? So one of the things that we talk about at the division is really thinking about the recipe for a meaningful life. Uh, and in that, you'll see these seven different areas that we kind of talk about. We have a whole separate presentation that focuses specifically on recipes uh, that we're always happy to do as well. But in general, when we talk about recipes, it's talking about thinking about people's relationships, thinking about their employment, the employment that they've had in the past or skills that they have developed around um, employment or even just skills they develop and how it can influence their employment. The chores that they've had, sometimes we don't always recognize that the chores that people have done in their lives can also help support them in identifying some employment opportunities they may be interested in. The individualized health and well-being, right, helping understanding what that person likes, how they maintain their health, the different things that um, are associated to that and how we can help them be supported. Um, the places to live, where have they lived, where are the places that they're interested in living, how do we help support them in getting more information about future plans on living. Um, education, what information do they need? Uh, do they want to do a trade school? Do they want to do a certificate program? Do they want to take a class? What does that look like for them? And then of course, social life, right? How do we help them maintain the social life that they're interested in um, or develop more? So one of the things I also talk about are things called the three E's, education, experience, and exposure. And one of the things that um, we found is really useful for people who are preparing to transition to the adult system is really thinking about those three areas, um, making sure that not only did we talk about these, um, this recipe, but also that people have truly had the opportunity to have experiences that help them make choices, have the exposure to know what choices are out there and then um, education and then also the education to understand as much as they can what they can do how they can achieve xyz goals because the one thing that we always learn is that if one if a person only has had one option in their life um, they it may seem as though that's the one that they're choosing however when they actually get the opportunity to see multiple options or understand multiple options it helps them make a better more concrete choice and helps them with having more of a fulfilled life. Now, some tools to help with going through this process. One of them is called the Life Trajectory Tool. It's a really great tool that um, we use. Um, we encourage that um, all of you consider utilizing as you work through the process with uh, learning about what a person desires, what they don't desire in their life, and how to help influence the conversation when they're starting to prepare for the future. Okay, so this is coming from the life course traject, uh, life course tools.com. Um, it's from trying the life course framework. Um, and this tool, um, which we again was, um, was something that was also shared with you as a resource today, can be used when working with the individuals and families that you're working with, right? So, talking about sometimes it's harder to talk about what we want or um, just only think about things in the way of what we want, but we also take the opportunity to think about what don't I want, right? And so a lot of times when we go through this exercise, we start off with, okay, so what are the things you don't want, right? We don't want, um, let's say, I'll use myself in case you to feel isolated. 
We don't want NKG not to be able to um, work with pets. We do want her to get the opportunity to work with pets. We do want her to get the opportunity to um, do community service. We do want her to X, Y, and Z, right? And start to fill in the different sections of this tool to really help influence one, a clear understanding as to what I want my life to look like in essence. And then also, what are the things that we still need to do in order to help achieve that? And as we start to plan for the future, then taking this tool as we move into um, transitioning into the adult service system and things of that nature to help with the conversation and make sure we're all on the same page. Excuse me, MK Chief, one moment, please. Uh, we're getting some requests to, uh, if you could slow down your presentation. Oh, no problem. I'm Thank sorry, you. I just want to make sure <laughs> we got through everything, but I can definitely slow down. Okay, so this is the trajectory, um, as I mentioned. Uh, again, a great tool that you're able to utilize. If you go to the life course, um, life course doc, life course tools com, they also have other resources that can be very useful as well. Okay, so as I mentioned, um, here you'll see that they have the past life experiences. We have moving um, what we want to do moving forward. What are the things that we need in order to do that? And then on the side, you see uh, what I don't want, and also the vision for what I do want, right? What does a good life look like? Um, great tool can be used for anyone. And even for um, ourselves, we went through it ourselves to kind of utilize it for our own lives. Because one of the things that we talk about is the whole concept of all and understanding that everyone has the same rights. And we wanna make sure that we are utilizing these tools in a way that we understand as well as we're working with the people that we're supporting. This is another tool. Um, this one is called the, um, the STAR. Uh, and what you see in this STAR is that it focuses on the five different areas of a person's life um, and different things that influence that, right? So really talking a lot about, well, what relationships does that person have? What relationships do they want to create? What uh, eligibility specific supports do they have? or things that they would like to utilize. Um, and then also what are some of the community-based things? Because one of the things that we always learn is that it's not just seeking services that um, will help someone have the full life they're looking for. It's sometimes building those community-based supports as well. So understanding what they are currently, as well as what are the other ones that we can also utilize as well. And then lastly, we have technology. What are technology supports that that person has um, and how can that help them achieve the lives that they're looking for? And then of course, the person, personal strengths and assets of that person, right? When we do these stars, we recognize that sometimes we don't even acknowledge some of these skills or great things that we have access to. And they can also help influence and support what that person's looking to do in their life moving forward. What's great about these tools is that they're not a one and done thing. Um, they continue to evolve, they continue to be added to. Some people will put it on their fridge or revisit it every three months to see, um, has anything changed? Or, oh, I didn't think about this before, let me add this, right? And as they work with new people or move from conversation to conversation, now you have some additional tools that can be supportive of those conversations as you move forward. So like I said, um, these tools, are available on the lifecoursetools.com, uh, so you're able to also access it there. So services available for eligible individuals through DBD. So people like to ask, what services do we have available? What you'll see is that this is a full list of all the services available in our service system currently. So um, the key thing that I always like to point out is that and both the supports program and the community care program both have generally all the same services with the exception of a handful, which you can see in front of you, okay? Um, one of the great things is that just because someone's on the supports program doesn't mean that they're uh, missing out on a lot um, by being on supports versus community care program. And the other thing I always like to share with people, and we can definitely talk more about this as well, is that whether you're on the supports program or the community care program, you are able to access housing support. 
Now on the supports program, um, it is mainly someone being able to get their own apartment. And on the community care program, it's the same thing, but they also have access to the group homes, right? And so one of the things that I always encourage families to think about is that if they do not meet the higher level of need to be on the community care program, it's still okay in the sense of, we can still plan for your future, still have your son or daughter plan to have their own apartment um, or shared apartment, and one of the things that they would do is then think about utilizing the budget they receive through our service system to help develop the supports they need in their, um, in their home to achieve the goals that they're looking for, okay? So sometimes they may be planning to move into their own place um, and utilizing their services in that way, okay? So we're gonna talk a little bit about steps to accessing these services. So one of the key things that I always like to reinforce is that I know um, in the past, and I think um, less and less people um, remember this or still operate in this idea. Um, however, we only provide services for people older, 21 and older. Uh, I know in the past, we used to provide services for uh, children, um, adolescents and adults. However, at this point, it's only for people 21 and older. Anyone accessing services, prior to 21 would be accessing it through the school system or the children's system of care, right? And so one of the great things though that we've been able to do is allow people to go through the application process starting at 18 while they're still accessing school services, while they're still accessing um, services through perform care. Um, and, and then they'll be able to start receiving their services through the division immediately as they turn 21. We're going to talk about that together as well. So one of the things that we do is even though we're saying don't begin the application process until um, 18, you can still start planning beforehand. So I talked about some tools already, um, but then also one of the other tools that we um, or sites that we also fund is called Planning for Adult Life. And Planning for Adult Life is a program that is funded by the division who really provides additional information and support all around transition, okay? So they talk about the division, but they also talk about other things like guardianship or support decision-making um, and bring up any other topics that individuals and families are looking for. One of the key things that I always like to point out about Planning for Adult Life is that they have a webinar series called Webinar Wednesdays. And those webinars um, happen on a Wednesday, uh, once a month, um, and those, and they're all archived. And they're topics that both professionals, individuals, um, families, they request. And based off of their request, then they would find speakers to do those um, presentations, um, have those speakers come in. They are live webinars, but they record each one. So if there's a family that you are supporting, and let's say they need more information about guardianship, or they need more information about DDD transition, or whatever the case may be, this is a great opportunity for you to find the webinar that's archived, share that with the family, so that it's also reinforcing whatever information you've already shared. Now, one of the tools that we've also been able to create uh, that has been really helpful for people as they transition into the adult service system is um, this tool before you, okay? So it's our timeline for students exiting the school system and turning 21. We've been doing this for several years now. I wanna say probably since 2015, 2016 or so. Um, and at this point, we've gotten a lot of feedback that's been very helpful and supportive. What you'll see is that there's four main steps that we talk about in the transition process, okay? And those four steps we're going to go through together. But I like to point this out to you because this is a one-stop shop for a lot of our families. So if nothing else is taken from today's presentation, um, getting this document, which is available on our website, as well as on the Planning for Adult Life website, um, you can print it, share it with your families, encourage them to put it on their fridge or put it as part of their planning binder um, and help them just know that they just need to check off each step as they complete them. Again, 
this process starts in 18 for a lot of people. So um, the way that we set it up, it makes it easy for people to focus on one step at a time. Now, the other things I like to point out on this document, because uh, we'll reference it as we continue to go through today's presentation, um, is that you'll see that we have our four steps right here. We also have our community service office phone numbers on the sheet as well. Um, you'll see on the back, it tells you a guideline for how people can work through the last year of school and make sure they are getting um, access to our services as soon as they can. Um, and any um, resources that they may need are also here as well, including the information about planning for adult life and so forth. So like I said, 18, 18 is that magic number for a lot of our students. Once they begin to get ready to come into our service system, the first step I always encourage um, individuals and families to do is to begin by applying for SSI and or an, another Medicaid waiver program. Now, as many of you already know, in order to access our services, a person must obtain and maintain Medicaid. And there may be some people you're working with who have children's Medicaid. However, they must switch over to the adult Medicaid, right? And so that's where going through the process allows them to make sure they have access to the adult Medicaid and therefore know that they'll be eligible to begin to access our services, okay? Now, we always say SSI because a lot of people are eligible for SSI. But we do recognize that there's a lot of people who may not be eligible for SSI. If they're not eligible for SSI, there are other Medicaid waiver programs that are available, and we encourage people to look into that. Now, at the end of today's presentation, if someone begins that application process um, and finds that they are having some trouble with accessing or um, obtaining Medicaid, let's say they get one program over another, there, we do have a Medicaid help desk. Um, that person can reach out to as long as they've begin, begun the process already, okay? Now, as we continue to talk, there's one that I always like to um, recommend or remind people of, and that's NJ Workability. And NJ Workability gives people the opportunity to still maintain employment, but then also begin to access um, Medicaid as well, okay? So I know that there are some individuals that, um, we're supporting and they actually are working diligently. They have a job part-time or full-time and they would really like to keep that job but also get the supports that they need. And so New Jersey has uh, developed the NJ Workability Program to support people in acknowledging that. They may still need some supports but they still should have the right and the ability to work. The next step is going to be doing the intake process. We'll talk about that together in a second. And then it's, completing the New Jersey Comprehensive Assessment Tool um, as we move forward. So as we talk about the intake process, the thing that I always like to point out, which has happened in the last year, year and a half, is the development of our full and our short application. So if a person has already been determined eligible for DD services through performed care after the age of 18, then when they are ready to begin the application process with the division, then they would do the short application, okay? I encourage individuals and families to do the application 19 and older, and I'll explain why as we move forward, okay? Now, if the person has not been determined eligible through performed care um, after the age of 18, then they would have to complete the full application. The difference is it's just uh, several sheets of information. Um, we're trying to minimize how much repetitive information a person needs to provide, um, but it's not much of a difference. It's just different, uh, different level of documentation that is required, okay? So when people go through the intake process, there's two main purposes of that. One is to help ensure that that person meets functional criteria. They must meet three out of the seven areas of functional criteria. The seven areas are listed on our website. However, that is embedded within um, the NJ CAT that someone um, fills out, okay? So it's not going to be a separate thing, but it's within the application process uh, because in order to have a complete application, a person also needs to have completed the New Jersey Comprehensive Assessment Tool, which we'll walk through together. Now that NJCAT 
must be completed within two years of someone coming into our service system. And so because of that, that's why I encourage people to come in and do the uh, application 19 and older. Now, let's say someone is um, unsure if they're going to be eligible for our services, and they really just want to make sure that they complete it um, ASAP, they are able to do it at 18. However, right before they come into our service system, they'll have to do the NJCAT one more time. And that's, again, because it needs to be done within two years of them coming into our service system. Okay. And then the second part of what, uh, what the application process does is to ensure that a person has um, applied and obtained Medicaid. Because again, they're only able to access our services if they have Medicaid, okay? So that's why I encourage step one to complete the Medicaid process. Know that that person has had that, and then um, they'll begin to do the application process 19 and older. Here are several documents that are required within the intake process. And then also um, additional documents that are helpful, but not necessarily completely necessary throughout the process. And this list you also can find on the application that is available on our website for anyone to view. Um, I also encourage people to view it before they are planning on actually filling it out so that they're familiar with what documents they may need to gather and so forth. So now as we talk about the NJCAT, uh, the NJCAT is broken up in three main areas, um, self-care, behavioral, and medical needs. It's quite a lengthy document. Currently it's being done with a um, intake worker who is uh, focused on complete, supporting people through completing the NJCAT. Um, they would do this currently through Microsoft Teams with individuals and families and those who would like to support them through that process, okay? I encourage people to take a look at a copy of it prior to going through the um, assessment. Um, a copy of it is available on our website for people to take a look at. Now, once they have done that, um, the NJCAT helps establish the tier the person is going to have um, and ultimately the budget that they, the up to budget that they will have when um, going through the process. Now, I do want to make note um, if people are following along that it's no longer required to do the NJCAT every five years. Um, it's by request at this point. So if something, let's say, changes in that person's life um, and they would like to go ahead and do the NJCAT again to get a reassessment, um, they're able to do that. Uh, I always like to remind people, though, that when asking to do a reassessment, you will be granted one at this time. Um, and then based off of whatever tier you receive, after completing that assessment, that will be the tier that that person will have moving forward. So the tiers that people have is between a tier A all the way to a tier E. Tier A meaning that they have the least amount of needs to a tier E meaning that they have the most. Then there's a possibility of someone having an acuity factor. And that represents that that person may have a significant clinical medical or behavioral support need uh, that requires their budget to be a little bit um, higher. So once they've done those first three steps, that helps determine if that person is eligible or ineligible for our services, right? So again, the first three steps is one, Medicaid, two, the DDD application, and three, the NJCAT. All three help determine eligibility to our service system. And they would go ahead and um, receive a letter that says, welcome, you've been determined eligible for our services. Please go forward and uh, select a support coordination agency, okay? On that letter, it'll also say the person's tier, but it will not say their budget. They would have to go into what's called our supports program or our community care program manual to see what that budget is. I don't necessarily think that it's um, completely necessary to fully you know, analyze your budget to an extent because your support coordinator is going to help you through the process of how to utilize your budget um, and access the services that you're looking for. But we do encourage people to take a look at that um, just so that you're, you're aware, okay? Now, if a person's been determined ineligible for our services, then they would go ahead and apply um, um, I'm sorry, they would go ahead and seek 
to um, go through a process to be reviewed to see if they would be eligible to receive our services by going through the um, uh, ineligibility. I'm sorry, I totally lost my train of thought. Um, so they would be able to appeal uh, if they would like to. That's what I was trying to say. <laughs> So what is support coordination? So in a nutshell, support coordination is care management that's provided through Medicaid and DD approved support coordination agencies. This does not come out of a person's budget. Um, they are a service that helps people navigate their, um, their budget as well as navigate accessing their services. Uh, they use person-centered planning processes to identify outcomes and services needed and they work specifically to help develop the individual service plan. Um, they help with linking people to the providers, right? And we'll talk about more about well, what the providers look like and how to even know more about them. Uh, they conduct monthly monitoring, right? Just checking in, right? Because again, nothing that we talk about is stagnant. If a person completes the individual service plan, similar to the IEP, that um, a lot of students are familiar with, if there's a change, if there's um, something that they would like to do differently, then that support coordinator helps them with that change in, the, in their plan uh, and helps to make sure that that um, will work with their budget and so forth, okay? Now the individual can change support coordination agencies upon request. And all they would do is they would fill out um, the selection form again and identify the new support coordination agency that they're looking to work with. So when can someone access a support coordinator? Great question. Um, and so pretty much what happens is that in the last year of educational entitlement, we recognize that we wanted to really help individuals and families to minimize the gap between leaving the school system and beginning accessing services in the adult system, okay? So in the case that someone turns, um, well, let's start with during their last year of educational entitlement, what will happen is that fall of their last year, they're able to actually go through the process of selecting support coordinator as long as they've already completed the other three steps we talked about. Once they've done that, then in um, April, they'll be assigned a support coordinator um, and then that support coordinator will work with them. They can attend one of their uh, final IEP or transition meetings to help understand more about what the person may have already been accessing and also help with the development of their ISP. And then ideally, as they graduate in June, they'll be able to uh, begin accessing services as long as they're available and ready, okay? Now, in the case that let's say a person turns 21 prior to April of their last year of educational entitlement, they are able to begin to access our services as long as they um, put in their selection form up to two months prior to their 21st birthday. Okay, the only thing that people will not be able to access while still in school is going to be the day program. And that's primarily because they're still attending school. Now, as we know, um, there have been some opportunities for people to get the additional year of special education uh, due to the current um, pandemic that we've been living through. And so because of that, for those individuals and families, Again, they can continue to um, access services through the school as outlined um, through the, the, the law that was signed in, but to also give them the opportunity to begin to access services through the division um, that is not duplicative. So if a person is accessing services through the school during that time, they are able to do so. Um, they can then still access services through the division um, that just do not correspond with what they're already accessing. So that gives them the opportunity to still receive the services that they are eligible for, even through the adult system at that time. Okay. And if there are any questions um, about this, if there's any concerns, because I know there's always some nuances that people really want more information about, um, you can reach out to our help desk. Our unit does have a help desk that we do try to help people um, get clarification around this. 
um, and they would just reach out to the help desk that's listed below. So I'm going to go through some of this other stuff a little bit quicker, just to make sure I get through um, any questions that people may have. Okay. So when someone does get a support coordinator, roughly that support coordinator reaches out to them within three days. Uh, they plan an in-person and or currently a virtual meeting with the family um, to talk about their person-centered planning tool, talk about their hopes and dreams. And this is also a great opportunity to bring those tools we talked about earlier to the meeting, to the discussion, so that the individual and family is bringing all the information that they can to the table and the support coordinator can help them with understanding a little bit more about what that person is looking for in their lives and how to develop a plan that's gonna be suitable. And then ideally within 30 days, they have an individual service plan that is approved. So this we're not gonna really go through too in detail, but the, generally the assessment that um, influences a lot of what people use or their budget is going to be the NJCAT. What helps develop the individual service plan is the information gathered through the NJCAT and the person-centered planning tool. And then we continue to monitor and see how um, people are doing with their approved plan and how we can make adjustments moving forward. So some resources that I'd like to share with you all. Um, one key thing is that um, we are open. Uh, we are um, mainly still doing a hybrid at this time of working remotely and in the office. So you can feel free to reach out to the phone number below, um, go to our website, as well as utilize the different help desks that I'm going to share with you today. Um, always be able to go to our website. Uh, there's a lot of helpful information. If you'd like to know more about fee-for-service, um, like to know more about transition, like to know more about anything I talked about today, um, there is information available on there, including the housing um, and housing support. Um, here's the link to the timeline uh, that I mentioned earlier, as well as the link to the community care program uh, manual. Um, here is a link to the NJCAT assessment, as I mentioned earlier, as well as the provider database where people can actually sort through all of the approved providers um, that they would like to look into. So they would just put in what kind of service they're looking for and it'll show the list of approved providers at this time. We also have how to select a provider that's available through the BOG Center. That's very helpful. And there's a guide also called how to select a support coordinator. And then lastly, these are some of the um, email addresses that can be very helpful through the process for families and individuals. Um, again, the Transition Help Desk, anything about transition, we're here to help. Um, the Supports Program Help Desk, Medicaid Help Desk, especially as it relates to um, people having trouble with obtaining um, Medicaid or anything around that. And then the Fee-for-Service Implementation Help Desk. Um, we also have the DDD communi Communications email address that I always encourage that if you are not already on our listserv to join our listserv because we do share some great information and up-to-date information that may be helpful to you as well as to the people that you're supporting. So with that being said, thank you. Um, I um, thank you guys for bearing with me. I know I said spoke a lot and I provided a lot of information, but I did want to make sure we got enough time to get to some of the questions. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and try and sort through some and see if I'm able to answer any in the time that we still have. Um, okay, so one question that we received says, uh, can you please advise who should parents slash students contact to follow up status of their application with DVD as they are preparing to transition? Great question. So if uh, an individual or family has not received um, any response after completing their application roughly within two to four weeks, um, then they, would, they can reach back out to the community service office that they are closest to. So if you remember the timeline I shared earlier, it had a list of community service offices, they can go ahead and reach out to one of them. However, if they're not getting a response, what I would say is reach out to the Food for Service help desk and they will direct it to the right place. Okay. Next question. Uh, 
Great question. So um, a person asked if they are on the community care waiting list um, when you are under 55 and get to the top of it, are you considered for CCP or do you move to the priority waiting list? Generally what will happen at this time is if a person does um, reach the age of 55, let's say their, their caregivers reach the age of 55 and the individual themselves is at least over the age of 18, they would have to uh, apply and put themselves on the priority waiting list. Um, it does not trans transition for you. So they would have to go up onto that, um, the application and reapply to be on the priority waiting list at that time. How to, um, um, so another great question related to the waiting list um, is in regards to how to actually go through the process. If you go to the DDD website, you'll be able to um, find information about the wait, waiting list. Um, I always say that our, our website is Google friendly. So if you type it in, um, it will probably be one of the first easy access links directly to that specific page on our um, website, and you'll be able to go through the application process. It gives you the information there, as well as a document that you're able to open and where to submit it. Um, I was asked if I can please pr um, provide a link to the tools that I was discussing in the chat. I will try um, once I get through a few more questions, but I did also share a copy of the trajectory um, that should be in your resources today. Um, and you can also still find it on the lifecoursetools.com. Um, but I will try to get that link for you and put that in the chat um, if we don't run out of time. So a question is, if a person decides to live, um, to live home, would he or she get all the support from DDD? Absolutely. So one of the great things about our services is that even if someone is on the CCP, and they would like to live at home, they can still access their services and live at home. What they would do is then get in-home services um, that would be brought to them uh, instead. So it is possible. Great question. So this person says, are the children that take advantage of the extra year of school um, able to access these services at the age of 21 when they won't graduate until 22? Yes, they're able to do so. Um, again, the things that they're not able to access will be the day program and any other services that uh, would be considered duplicative. So if there's any questions about what would be considered duplicative or not, you can reach out to the Transition Help Desk and we'll be able to help answer that question for you. So this next person asks if the timeline has been updated for this year. Great question. So you are probably are someone who has seen as we've transitioned um, into fee for service, we were updating our timeline on a yearly basis. We have now gotten to a place where we're no longer updating it every year. So it is the same timeline um, that you have seen for the last two years now. Um, there is no update at this time. We probably will have one more update in the near future, but at this time, it is still good to go. Yeah, we're not updating it year by year any longer. So this person asks, is it best to do SSI or Medicaid? Um, it's not so much if one is better than the other. It just really depends on what that person's needs are and um, what they would qualify for, right? So like I said, SSI sometimes has, a, well, SSI does have a cap as to how much money a person can have in their possession or their account at a given time. So uh, a lot of times, the, the times I see it most is let's say someone's working or anything like that, they may um, not be eligible for SSI because they may have more than $2,000 in their account at one given time, but they may be eligible for NJ workability, right? The other thing that sometimes families uh, need to consider as they're transitioning is that how much money it has parent or caregiver given to that child or is in that child's name because that can affect their SSI as well. And so um, some families may need to look into ABLE accounts or special needs trust um, prior to um, that child even turning 21. So that is something else they may want to start thinking about or looking into around 18 or 
um, around that, just to be aware of what they may need to do to make sure their son or daughter is going to be eligible for Medicaid moving forward. Um, and there is more information. I wanna say we do have more on our website as well as Planning for Adult Life has it. And then of course, Medicaid themselves has information about um, the different Medicaid waiver programs as well. So this person asks, how can I get a DD rep to come to our school to do a presentation? Great question. Reach out to our transition help desk. Um, we have a team of people who do presentations throughout the state, um, similar to this, a lot slower sometimes, um, but we do try to make sure that we give this information to both professionals as well as individuals and families. We do encourage that there's about five to 10 people would be uh, in attendance to this presentation uh, so that we're able to do it. Currently, we are providing webinars, but if you would like someone to come to your school, you can definitely let us know as well, and we'll try to make that accommodation too. Um, if there are 18... Okay, so this person, I'm trying to read some of them in a, a little bit in advance, but I'm going to read them out loud as well. So if there are 18, if they are 18 to 21 and not DAD eligible, they must complete the full application. Do they receive services from perform care until they turn 21? Great question. So yes, if a person is between the age of 18 to 21 and they have not necessarily accessed, um, they have not been determined eligible for DD through, DDD through perform care after the age of 18, then one, they would complete the full application with us. And then two, they would continue to receive services until they turn 21 from the school system or perform care. Now, if you are uh, uh, not sure which application a person needs to fill out, that's completely fine. Reach out to the community service office that is located closest to where that person resides and ask them. They'll be able to help you know, yes, this person should uh, do the complete full application or no, they only need to do this short. So you can reach out. We're able to help answer that question as well. So this question comes saying, if a student um, does apply, so let's say a student is 18 and because they chose to graduate, um, they got help from the school to complete their application prior to graduation, uh, would they have to reapply later on? And the answer is they can go ahead, complete the full application process at 18. However, right before they come into our service system, they're going to have to complete the NJCAT one more time. So it's just the NJCAT that they would have to re, um, redo. They wouldn't have to do the application again. They wouldn't have to um, show proof of Medicaid again. I mean, we'll still be able to see in their in our system that they maintain Medicaid. So it's all about maintaining it at that point, but they would have to do the NJCAT. And that's mainly to make sure that as the person comes into our service system, that we have all the um, right information to make sure we have the right budget as they move forward. And Kichi, this is Amy. I'm sorry to interrupt. We have a hard stop right now. It's yes. five. We do want to thank you so much for participating and a big thank you to presenting for us today. Uh, for our attendees, uh, be sure to check out the rest of the New Jersey Transition Conference. Additional workshops and information can be found on njyouthtransition.life. Um, all of the uh, recordings will be live on the website within the next few days. Thank you, and we will see you next time. Thank you all.